Well, we have a very special guest here once again with Coach Pete. I'm Chuck Caton, and we have ESPN's own Chris Berman, one of the original members. Well, at least uh, two weeks into the network uh, back in 1979, uh, my good friend Mr. Berman uh, joined ESPN and I think uh, really put the uh, network on the map. And I'm sure you've got some great stories of those days. Welcome to the program. Hi, Chuck. Always a pleasure to hear your voice. Coach, nice to meet you over the uh, <laughs> over the airwaves. Chuck, I, I don't, you know, I wasn't the first one, but I I guess I'm a member of, <laughs> we'll put it in hockey terms, which between you and me, we always have to. I guess I'm, a, I'm an original six team, right? You are, <laughs> absolutely. In fact, you could probably answer the trivia question. When uh, ESPN went on the air, which was about two weeks before I started with the Hartford Whalers back in 79, uh, I believe I'm trying to think, George Grand and who did the first show? Do you remember? Uh, well, George Grand and Lee Leonard. Ah. Did the first, first sports center. Now, here's a trivia question you won't know the answer to. <laughs> what was our first quote game? Well, it was a game. I mean, it was oh, a game. wait a minute now. It, it, it was a tennis oh, this match. Is, this is big. Uh, oh, big. tennis. Billy Jean King. Ready? Go ahead. Want to take a gamble at it? That, yeah, that, that that was my guess. I mean, I don't know if it I was. bet it's Australian rules football. <laughs> I, I thought it was a no, tennis well, match. No tennis, or you or... know, that was too good. Australian oh. rules football came on a little later. That was good <laughs> stuff. We had. Uh, men's professional slow pitch softball. Oh, wait a minute! No. I don't remember and, that and, at all. Yeah. And the teams were the Milwaukee Schlitz. <laughs> That's a great name. Uh, playing the Kentucky Bourbons. <laughs> and oh we had one sponsor in those days, Budweiser. Right. I'd heard about that because Budweiser really made a smart investment early uh, when Bill Rasmus had started, uh, you know, was credited at least for starting after he got fired from the New England Whalers. That's another story uh, that he when he began it and then uh, got some financing, got, uh, you know, some advertising back at, uh, backing from Anheuser-Busch, right? Well, they were the they they made a, a five year deal, which was you know a drop in the bucket for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it was for NCA sports. Well, I, I don't want to say that because you wouldn't think beer in that, so I've misspoken there. But it was <laughs> five years of stuff. Right. Now we had some little advertisers put out that Budweiser's checks weren't going to bounce, so that was a big deal. That's I mean any bit like that helped put us on the map. It was. It was an interesting time, both for you starting where you were and, and me. You know, so how old were you when you started in '79? Uh, with the Whalers, twenty-six and a half. So I was a little uh, older. I was than twenty-four. You. Yeah, you were twenty-four, and just uh, twenty-four. I did the two thirty show in the morning. Yeah, tell which us was about 11 that. Eleven thirty, eleven thirty out west. Um, but you lived in Connecticut, so you're driving home at three in the morning, and it's snowing <laughs> in January, and you're wondering. You know, this career, I, I certainly hope it makes a left-hand turn at some point, you know? <laughs> yeah. But it did, and I'm still there. So it, it, it I, you know, I'm the right place at the right time. I guess I was smart enough not to screw it up, Chuck. Well, folks, we are talking to Chris Berman from ESPN. Chris, I, I remember, you know, you, you guys basically revolutionized sports for us because uh, my parents were from Boston. We moved to North Carolina. Used to sit in the driveway in a 1974 Ambassador station wagon with my dad in the middle of the night listening to the Red Sox games to try to find out the score. And if you didn't listen, you had to wait to two days later in the newspaper because the, the newspaper that came out the next day didn't have the scores. So ESPN has brought the sports world home to everybody, hadn't it? Well, certainly back in those days, um, it was, and us doing the late show those first four years, a lot of them with Tommy Mees. I remember Tommy. Fellow, the late great Tommy Mees. Um, uh, we we were tomorrow's paper. Yep. You know, we they were the finals, and then after a year or two, the the, the, the late show was repeated in the morning. So you actually lived in the east. You know, maybe going to war was on from six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, nine to ten. So you got the Dodgers and the Giants score. You know, um, which you never had. Correct. That's for sure. Yep. You never had that till two days later. So. We we really we were the first look at tomorrow's paper in the day. That's what we thought it was. And if you miss Sports Center, you could always watch Australian Rules Football and watch the ticker go by. Well, <laughs> yeah. I get it. Well, we didn't have ticker. Then you kidding? The ticker <laughs> well, that's might right. have been no, no the ticker. thing that the egg that's timer right. that's you know right. that you had in the kitchen. We didn't ticker. Oh, we didn't. Have, we didn't have the capability to do there that. There was a lot didn't. of Australian Rules Football, and I, and my brothers and I. Well, it was good. Watch that. Yeah, we loved Listen, it. Loved it. 
six, uh, 18 guys a side, Chuck. <laughs> oh, my uh, gosh. Coach. I mean, it was organized mayhem. There were 36 people. There are 36 people on the field at wow. one time. The field's a, about a, a one and a half NFL fields. Um, nobody wore any padding. I mean, <laughs> That's, that's some crazy stuff now. We had real fans for that. You know, Chris Berman is our guest here, and I think that uh, when you talked about the personality that you brought to ESPN and still do bring, uh, everybody would like to know about the nicknames. Obviously, awesome. uh, with Oda B. Young again, McDowell, and all of the other great uh, nicknames you had. You might even give one to Coach later on in the show here, but... Uh, in getting that editorial license, Chris, to do that, was that very difficult, or did they just let you be yourself? Well, part of it, Chuck, was 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> I don't know that they were up for the bosses, A. Okay. B, none of them were derogatory, okay? None of them were off cut. They're all plays on the name. Um, part of it was I didn't do it to be noted. I mean... Revisionist history for a while. Well, he wanted to have a catch. No, no, no. We're on. We're on for a half hour back then, and we had Seattle five, Kansas City two. That was the graphic. Most of the games weren't on TV. We had nothing. So you're going to put that five to two is going to sit up there for a minute. Well, do something with it. Absolutely. Right? Now, we're not making fun <laughs> of anybody. We're not. You know, that was one of the best ones. Ought to be young again. Make that bird be home by eleven. <laughs> Uh, it's probably well and the beauty of the more a i felt that i was renewing a lost art of baseball it wasn't like i was reinventing anything i mean i certainly didn't invent babe ruth or say hey kid or the splendid splinter et cetera, et cetera. um they, they they were fun so if you heard bert be home by 11 right you're watching with your <laughs> girlfriend your sister your your father your mother you don't have to know that he was a curveballer, that he played for Pittsburgh or Minnesota or whoever it was at the time. All you know is that as a parent, you said that to your kid once, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And as a kid, you heard it a million times, right? So these weren't, this wasn't brain surgery, but it was like fun. It was not meant to do anything other than fun. And in the end, I mean, a couple of them came out, um, my first baseball season would have been the spring of 80. Um, and, you know, we used to nickname, we used to play around reading box scores at college at Brown. And a couple of them came out at 2.30 in the morning. They just came out. The first ones were either Frank Tanana Dacry <laughs> or uh, John Mayberry RFD. That's right. <laughs> one of those one. two that came out by accident. <laughs> And yeah, that's uh, good for our area here. Absolutely apropos. You know, and it made yeah. its way into football, though, with Drew Bledsoe. <laughs> well, it made a lot of football. Like Steve, I got Juve Bono and, and Curtis, my favorite, Martin. And, I mean, the Eric, the enemy, Eric sleeping with the, the enemy. enemy. I remember that? <laughs> yep. well, there were a lot, well, that was under the highlights of Prime. See, under the highlights, when you're not, when you're looking into the camera, that's not the time to deliver that. It's under the highlights, and some of them were rock and roll nicknames, obviously a ton of them. Um, you could sing the song a lot, like Bono would go back to pass Chuck. Right. And if he was, like, standing in the pocket looking around, you know, we would go, do 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 <laughs> Or if Warren Moon would complete a nice pass, and Tommy Jackson would sing it with me, you know. I'm being followed by Moon's shadow. You know, I mean, we would just, we just did it. It was for us. It was just fun. It was sports. It's just relax. And uh, didn't do it to be famous, but I guess it's one of my calling cards. So Andy Pettit throws a 97-mile-an-hour fastball down the pipe, and uh, David Ortiz gets a hold of it to center field. What happens next? Well, obviously you want me to crank up some backs, which, which would be some back, 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 gone. Now, if it's a real line drive, we call it a two-backer. Back, back, gone. Like, oh, yeah. At, out that fast. You know, if it's a majestic Ortizian or, you know, hit the most majestic of home runs, and I'm not necessarily the longest, although he certainly could hit him long. Who's that? Junior Griffey. Oh, yeah. They all, doing all those home run derbies through the year, they all had that arc. They weren't, oh, my God, that's going to take someone's head off, you know, 500 feet. But they were this arc. It's going to go out, 
but it's going to take a while, and it's a rainbow. So he would be a perfect back, 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 but you could take your time. <laughs> he must have enjoyed uh, my buddy Josh Hamilton. Then he went to school with my youngest son, Russ, here in Raleigh, and uh, what a we performance he put on in yeah. a home run derby several years ago. Well, that was the Yankee Stadium. I don't want to say the old Yankee Stadium, but <laughs> to youngsters now it is the old Yankee Stadium. I was in the real old one. I am old enough to go in the one that – Babe Ruth played. That's right. Not, that makes two of us. No, but we didn't see Babe Ruth, but we did see Mickey Mantle in there. You know, mm-hmm. but um, but he what he did that night, and because it was Yankee Stadium, where no one, no major league player had ever hit one out, et cetera, et cetera. Because it was Yankee Stadium, that even added to the lore. Or McGuire and Fenway. I mean, those are the two. If you're asking me of all those home run derbies I did, and I did all of them until a couple of years ago. I mean, the, the Josh Hamilton and Mark McGuire, but there were others. Somebody always put on an unbelievable, and usually in a round in which was too early to win the thing. Yeah. yeah. Josh didn't win. McGuire didn't win. Interesting how that worked. Absolutely. They're exhausted. It's You're amazing. Exhausted. They do. I mean, swinging that bat. I mean, especially the bat. Some of those guys swing. You can't keep doing it over. It's like cutting a couple cords of wood. Well, true. They, they, they've changed the rules so that yep. – you're not exhausted. I mean, there's no need to go into it, but, but they, so you're not penalized for having 27 homers in the first round. Well, no, I can't even walk to the plate, you know. <laughs> so um, that's always that's always kind of fun that one. But yes, back 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 would be would be apropos. Well, we've got about a minute left, and I, uh, you know, I've been watching you since I, I think I probably saw you the very first time you came on TV because we were excited as youngsters to to actually have a sports channel, but. Looking back over your years, what's your most fondest memory of ESPN or, or sports in general? Well, that's a long answer, but I know we got a short time. The, 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 most, the biggest thing I ever did, I happened, was fortunate enough to, again, it's baseball. I mean, obviously, the, the football Sundays start to finish. Yep. Game day, which then became countdown. And then, of course, NFL primetime. I mean, I would have to say 19 years of that show with Tom Jackson, you, everybody watched it, not because necessarily we were great, but – you got three games on TV. Well, what happened in the other ten? You know, so here they were. So we really NFL prime time is a, is the, my favorite long time thing. My favorite one time thing thing. You know, broadcast would be the night Cal Ripken passed Lou Gehrig for the most consecutive games played. We're, Remember that game? Martinez and I were fortunate enough to be in the booth, and we said nothing for twenty three minutes. The irony. And I leave this with Chuck. We, we talk for a living, right? All of us. We won an Emmy for that because we said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's About right. That. Well, you know, that saved baseball, that game, I think. Uh, uh, it, it certainly came at the right time. Yep. It was after the strike in 94, and that was September that. 6, 95. It, it, yeah, it went a long way into resurrecting it. If it, I don't, if, if it didn't save it, it certainly resurrected it in the minds of many, many, many people. What Cal did, I mean... The, 14 straight years of going to work without calling in sick with whatever job you're doing. Pretty good. Amazing. Absolutely. Just amazing. We even uh, any job, but when you think about it, this is a physical job he's going to, and he never missed a day of work. It's amazing to me. Well, you, didn't, I mean, you didn't miss many days either, Chris. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I wasn't, um, <laughs> I wasn't out there in a hundred degrees uh, trying to make sure I didn't, I didn't boot a ground ball and then run around the bases. I mean that I didn't, but that was, we all, we're lucky if if we love what we do. We're in the minority of folks, and you ride it for as long as you can. I mean, that would be my advice to any youngster and anybody. I mean, not you know, we understand that not everybody does what they really love, and if you you do like like Chuck does, and then forever, and 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 me, and you, wow, it, it's a dream come true. You're, you're you're lucky to do it. So why would you want to miss a day of work if if you can, if you don't have to? Right. Absolutely. Chris Berman, six-time national sportscaster of the year and my good friend and a probably the number one Hartford Whaler fan in the history of the game who remembers. <laughs> Other than you. Well, I appreciate that. June 19th, no, no. 2000. Saw, yeah. No, no. No, no. I, I <laughs> You're not getting away with it, Chuck. But I, <laughs> but I will buy you a dinner at Chuck's in the, in the Civic Center, uh, Chuck. All right, we'll have to turn the clock back. Chris Berman, so many thanks for joining us uh, right here on the program. For Coach Pete, I'm Chuck Caton. Again, Chris Berman, ESPN.